Good morning, good afternoon, uh, everybody. I'm Barry Parker for Capital Links Trending News podcast series. So today uh, we have on here, and I'd like to welcome Paulus Hagianu, who's the uh, chairman and the CEO of Safe Balkers, which is a New York Stock Exchange listed uh, company. It's a major dry bulk shipping company. And uh, just last week, Safe Balkers uh, announced their uh, Q1 2022 earnings uh, results, and that's the occasion. So we'll uh, talk about the company's performance, the strategy of the company, and then uh, developments in, in, the, uh, in, in the sector, in the dry bulk sector. So uh, with that, let's, let's begin. Um, so the first question is the, uh, the current state of the dry bulk shipping market. Uh, where it is, and uh, also let's mention uh, events in the Ukraine, which have been all over the news, and uh, China recently uh, with the lockdown, and what what the impacts are on the uh, the vessel positioning and the dry bulk trade routes. Yes, good morning. Uh, well, the state of the dry bulk market is uh, solid; it's improving. Uh, we had a very slow Q1, as uh, expected, but this time was uh, a little bit uh, longer, the slump, because of uh, uh, the outbreak of the war right after the Chinese New Year. So I would say that uh, uh, it affected a lot March as well, which usually is a month that the market starts, starts recovery. Uh, this recovery started uh, mostly in May uh, because right after the Chinese New Year, we had the, the, the war and then the COVID situation in the uh, Shanghai area, which as we know is the major industrial area of, uh, and the major business area of uh, China. So all this affected the market, but the market started recovering sometime end of April, beginning May. And uh, is looking again optimistic as we talk. Can you distinguish? Uh, they're they're uh, up, upward movers. Some of them are uh, geopolitical. Uh, you know, we mentioned the war, uh, and then some of them are, you know, fun, fundamental. You know, commodities uh, that are moving. Uh, so I wonder if you could distinguish those. And then also there's a there, there's a futures market uh, with a with the forward curve where the, the traders put uh, the, the price on the, uh, on, on the freight in the coming months. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and what that might be telling us. Yes, uh, the, the geopolitical factors uh, are stemming mainly be, because of the war and the effects of the war. We've lost the flow of cargoes out of Ukraine which is a major economy and the major producing country especially on wheat, grains, and also on the, for the steel industry. There are many uh, steel mills uh, there. Uh, this also had the repercussion of the sanctions to Russian cargoes. Uh, so many companies uh, follow these sanctions, uh, not to trade to Russia, it's affecting the trade. For the time being, uh, ton miles uh, are increasing because uh, certain cargoes are being carried from further uh, uh, away, from further uh, distance, like uh, Aussie cargoes into Red Sea, Aussie to Egypt, uh, US Gulf, uh, East Coast, South America. Some grains are coming from all these uh, uh, destinations. So it's, it's, it's improving on ton miles, but I think in the long run, uh, the effect of the war will be uh, uh, will give a headache to all uh, all of us because I don't think the rest of the world will be will be able to cover uh, the full amount of the of the grain out of Ukraine and uh, of Russia. So the fundamental uh, things that happen in the market is of course the rise of commodity prices, which is giving a boost. Uh, for the next six months to freight, freight rates, because you have to remember commod, uh, freight is also a commodity. And, uh, but of course, you have the strengthening of the US dollar that is, uh, is uh, not very helpful uh, for the market. So overall, we have factors that may affect the market further on, but in this volatile climate, 
many things could affect uh, the market either positively or negatively. So the fundamentals are kind of mi mixed in with the geopolitics, so hard to hard, hard to be precise. Uh, yeah, let's uh, let, let's shift over. Last last week you announced uh, the Q1 uh, results. I wonder if you you want to talk about what the major achievements and maybe what you want to uh, highlight in, in from that news release. Yes, Q1. Yes, Q Q1 results uh, were uh, as per uh, expectations in that. We had, a, we had a low market in March, uh, so it affected a little bit the revenue side. And also we had uh, OPEC side affected as well because uh, the war created inflationary pressures, uh, difficulty, difficulty in moving spare parts around. We have to bring spare parts with more, more expensive routes. Uh, shipping is relying on air freight for many of its urgent move of spare parts, quite heavy parts. Uh, those used to be carried on uh, on airline air, uh, freighter airlines, mainly with uh, Russian uh, big planes. Now this is being carried by other 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 uh, other uh, aircraft carriers, charging three or four times more than uh, used to be the cost of transportation. So this coupled with the uh, inflationary part created in uh, loops and pains because of uh, moving uh, oil prices, higher oil prices, and the COVID situation in, in, uh, in China and the restrictions we have worldwide uh, is increasing the cost. So uh, we average around $21,500 a day for Q1. For, for any other Q1, we would be smiling with this number. This year, we were expecting a little bit better, but uh, the market did not perform. It's performing better in Q2, so things should be better in uh, the second quarter. Yeah, but seasonally, uh, Q1 is, uh, is usually a weaker quarter. Is that, is that right? Yeah, yeah, you know very well, yes. <laughs> okay, so it'll go to, uh, hopefully it only goes in one direction. Uh, which is upwards. So let's let's talk about the uh, the strategy uh, going forward. I have a I, I have a bunch of questions here. So we're going to do fleet fleet deployment and then e expansion and then uh, get into your capital allocation and talk for a minute or two about uh, ESG. So let's let's start with the, uh, the the fleet deployment. I mean, I know you have uh, a lot, lot of your vessels are on period charter. Uh, so talk about the, uh, the strategy and then how you tie that into your, your sector outlook. And then, uh, you know, how do you, how, how do you balance between the, the, the spot and the, and the period charters that you have? Yes. Uh, the, the, the period charters we have are uh, mostly short period up to one year. We have uh, six uh, period charters on Panamaxis that they are index linkers from this summer for another three years, uh, which basically there is like trading the spot market. So they will follow the spot market. Uh, and uh, the other charters, especially on the Panamax to post Panamax are usually up to uh, eight or 12 months. So we have around 15 ships in the spot market, which we are working right now. Basically, the idea is to keep the, the scrubber fitted uh, ships in the spot market. We were expecting an increase of scrubber benefit, and we're trying to get the maximum benefit on that front. And uh, on, the, on the smaller ships like Panamaxes, we prefer to go into period charters up to one year. Now, regarding the capes, we recently been buying secondhand capes because we believe uh, China will do a big stimulus program after uh, the COVID uh, uh, situation. Uh, people were locked in in the uh, Shanghai area for most of uh, April and May. Shanghai is opening tomorrow, as we have heard uh, from friends out there. Uh, it's good news for all of us and for, for the market and for the Chinese economy, of course, which is affecting us uh, as well. So with uh, China out in uh, full force as from tomorrow, we expect uh, major improvements on uh, freight rates, especially for Cape size bulk carriers. 
So when we have the opportunity to employ our recently acquired bulkheads for two or three years, we will be doing that. So hopefully in the summer, we will be doing one or two more charters. On the smaller ships, we prepare to trade spot or up to one year charters. Okay, so we'll be looking uh, at I guess during the summer, you know, hopefully when it's a stronger market, then then you go into the period, the, the period cover. Indeed, especially on the bigger ships, we prefer to lock in uh, period charters at, at a reasonable uh, profit. And uh, remember, these ships are ships that we didn't buy very expensive. So we to write them off uh, within the three-year charter to below scrap value. So in mid, mid, uh, mid uh, age, uh, around 10-year-old ships, to take them down to below, well below scrap value within three years, it's a, it's a good investment for the company. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I'm gonna ask you about uh, fleet, fleet expansion. Uh, before I ask the question, I gotta give a shout out on your website, you have a great video. You have uh, a, a delivery you just took of a, a, a new build. So I, uh, I, I, I highly recommend that. I think, that, I think that's great. Uh, You've been active in uh, new build and secondhand markets. So you're building uh, in Japan. Uh, I think you had an order of of nine vessels. I, I I believe those are those are Campser Maxes, if I'm correct. Uh, you just took delivery on one, and I guess that's that's the video on there. So you have uh, eight to go between now and the end of 2024. Um, you've also been buying. I think you you mentioned this. You bought. Uh, Cape size ships. I think those are those those are Chinese ships. So yeah. talk a little bit about just the you know the strategy with uh, the the expansion. And I know you uh, the company uh, has a predominantly Japanese built fleet. Uh, how does it uh, work adding ad, ad, adding the Chinese uh, built vessels in there? How does that fit into the strategy? Yes. To be honest. To, to be honest with you, that uh, in the past we tend also to Chinese built ships when we couldn't find the uh, Japanese built uh, either new buildings or second hand ships uh, at the right price or at the right uh, delivery position. So at the moment uh, 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 we see that there is shortage of, uh, of uh, quality. Japanese built ships in the market, mainly because the freight market uh, is improving and many Japanese local owners are keeping the ships for themselves. So a company that has to buy a ship is getting proposed with nine Chinese ships and one Japanese built ship, especially on the Cape side. So earlier in the year, we managed to last, let's say in uh, September of last year and early this year, we managed to secure two or uh, Japan built Cape sizes 2012 and 2014 built. So we, we purchased those. Recently, we haven't been able to locate uh, uh, similar ships on Japan, or if there is a ship in the market, the price is well over 40 million. We elected to go for prices around 30 million, which makes us comfortable that we can pay off the investment in two or three years with a good. Uh, with one shot in a good, uh, <laughs> with a good fiction. Uh, also, you have to remember that uh, Chinese ships, they are uh, heavily built. They have a lot of steel value in today's environment of increasing uh, values of, of, of uh, steel. So it's, you know, it's a temporary measure until uh, more opportunities arise. But, you know, also in the past, we have done uh, Chinese built uh, new buildings at the proper yard and uh, something that in the future could uh, could uh, happen uh, you know in, uh, for always of course we will go only for uh, for new builds that they comply with phase three tier three requirements we are not going to order new ships with tier two or phase two requirement because it's very important these ships to achieve very low consumptions uh, for the new regulations. Yeah, so that, uh, that, that was kind of my next, ne next question, just how you, you factor, you are, you are looking at the environmental factors in all of, uh, in, in, in all of these decisions, uh, it, it sounds like. Yes. Yeah. So let me, uh, 
let me talk about uh, the capital allocation uh, part of it. You just announced uh, the dividend, quarterly dividend, that's uh, five cents a share. Uh, and you've been, uh, with all the liquidity you have, you've been buying the secondhand vessels and you've been uh, reducing your, your debt. It's important to point out, I think the debt is uh, right, right equal to, or may, maybe even below the scrap value of your, your, your fleet. So uh, how are you looking at the, uh, the capital allocation uh, going forward? Yes, uh, we, we reinstated the, the dividend two quarters ago. We started with five cents because we think that this is a long-term sustainable dividend because at the same time we have a new building program underway which we want to add to the fleet with the minimum possible debt and uh, we want to add also second hand ships uh, with prompt delivery dates especially in the cape size sector uh, to the fleet in order to increase the revenue the revenue uh, line so uh, also we recently did a bond in the Greek stock exchange at a very competitive uh, uh, rate of 2.95, 2.95, which uh, for five years unsecured uh, uh, corporate bond, uh, guaranteed of course by the listed company in New York. So uh, we use part of this to buy ships and uh, without debt and part of it to repay a part of our preferred shares of 8% to redeem part of the preferred shares of uh, that carry an eight percent coupon which is saving the company around three million a year on this uh, front so we we try to spread things around you know for me the dividend is uh, very important because we are major shareholders of the company sure. but uh, we want first of all to renew the fleet to keep the debt around the scrap value of the fleet uh, levels and at the same time, uh, renew the fleet, be the youngest fleet in the market in the comparison with the competitors and being able with the younger ships and the new builds with low consumption to deliver better results for, for our shareholders. I think we will achieve this because the fuel uh, cost and the energy cost is increasing and uh, even in 2014, the, the 2013, uh, Everyone rushed to do eco ships at the time because oil prices reached the uh, uh, same level like today of $120 per barrel. We have to remember that at that time, oil uh, uh, vessels, uh, heavy fuel oil prices was $600, whilst today the majority of the ships, so they burn VLSFO, which is uh, the price of VLSFO is around 1000 bucks today. Well, so the, you have to add on it the difference of, of that factor, that the ships are burning different type of fuel today, which is much more expensive. Well, you got a lot of things to balance, but I think net, net what struck me, you've delevered the company uh, extensively over, over the past few years. So yes. That's, we, uh, we, had to, we had to, and uh, we, we will have a strong liquidity. So if the market performs very well, we have an increasing fleet. If the market doesn't perform in 24 or 25, we still have the power to add a very cheap uh, modern ships in the fleet. It's a nice position to be in. I like that. Yeah, I think all the dry bulk companies are in a good position uh, right now. Oh, that's great. It's a great story. Let's talk about uh, ESG. ESG is in the news. And you mentioned, uh, you touched on scrubbers before and uh, just a minute ago, you, you you mentioned the fuel, but there's uh, there there's a lot to e ESG, and I know it's been been important for your company. Could you just talk about uh, what your major initiatives uh, are on that front? Yes, the, the the thing we always try to be ahead of the game on the on the environmental issues, and uh, in 2018, for example, 2019, we ordered. Uh, ahead of the, of the competition uh, scrubber for uh, just gas cleaning system for our vessels, uh, which we install in time and start performing at very high spreads in the second half of 2019. Of course, unfortunately, we had uh, after that the COVID in, in early 2020 and the spreads deteriorated, but now they have just exploded. 
and uh, it's payback time. It's payback time for the uh, for that investment, as well as the benefit we give to the environment because uh, our scrubber uh, uh, in the oceans, they are uh, they are uh, their emissions are uh, one twentieth of what is uh, from ships with uh, burning VLSFO. So we are doing our part there. Now, all our ships we have ordered till now and the future ships we'll order will all comply with phase three and uh, not uh, phase three on, on uh, IMO greenhouse gases and NOx tier three. Uh, there will be ships that they will be burning at least at least 25% uh, lower uh, consumption in, in, uh, in, uh, in the low RPMs of the vessel that we usually run the ships at, at slow speeds. So uh, these ships are very economic vessels. For example, the vessel you just mentioned, uh, MV Vasos, that we got delivery of last month, not last month, this month, earlier this month, around three weeks ago, was fixed on a maiden voyage, on a Trans-Pacific round voyage of uh, almost $36,000 a day, when the spot market for a similar type of vessels of two, three years old was uh, 28. The difference is because our ship burns 12 tons as opposed to 20 tons that uh, similar uh, ships, still modern ships are burning. So this gives you a very huge benefit, especially at the time when uh, VNSFO reached uh, $1,000 per, per ton. Yeah, that's, uh, that's power, that's power. 12, 12, 12 tons a day, wow. that's. Uh... Yeah, at the, at the, at, they are very competitive at the low speeds, and then they increase as we increase. So if we go all on the 14 knots, uh, we all burn about the same. But you can run the ships very economically at the slow speeds that usually charters perform at slow speeds. Okay, um, let's um, let, let, let's wrap it up. I mean, we have a lot uh, lot lot that we 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 talked about, but for investors who are uh, you know, who are watching this and, uh, you know, thinking of an investment, can you just uh, sum up, uh, you know, for safe balkers, what would, uh, what, what would be the investment highlights? I sum up about our company in general, about the dry bulk sector, because I think after a, after a number of years, the dry bulk sector is going to perform very well the next two years, because uh, as opposed to the previous 10 years, the, the, mark, the, 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 the balance between supply and demand is very fine. And we have a very slow, very low order book uh, on, the, on the Panamaxes, on the Cape size, even on the Ultramaxes, uh, that uh, gives us confidence that uh, we will enjoy even beyond 22 and 23, the good market. Secondly, I'm very optimistic about Chinese boosting their economy after the, after the COVID. As I told you before, tomorrow, China, uh, Shanghai area is- Yeah, free. they're opening up, yeah. They're opening up and this is a major, major news because they are opening up and the people there are very, very vibrant and ready to go. We had, uh, we had uh, discussions there with friends today and we, I mean, they are ready to go and, you know, Chinese, they are really hard workers uh, and uh, they can really catch up with what they've lost the last two months. So I don't see any slowdown uh, coming from China in the next few months. I think generally in Europe and in America and in uh, the Western world, uh, COVID is uh, reducing. We all uh, move around without masks and all these things. All this is major boosters uh, for, the for the economic activity. Of course, we have the problem of the expensive energy and the war, which is a very sad story and it should finish uh, uh, as, as, as possible. And the, and the whole world should sit down together and uh, find means and ways how this uh, stupidity stops. Well. Whether that comes from the east or the north or the west or the south. Because it's a, it, we're talking about people losing their lives for all, almost no reason, you know. So, yeah. uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is my view. So, uh, people may agree, may not agree, but, you know, it's against uh, humanity and it's against the, the, the modern world. So, let's hope that, you know, logic will prevail on all fronts and try and find the solutions and... Uh, 
Because you see, I mean, sanctions leads where? Leads to bad economies in the in the in Europe, in the Western world. Russia is affected worse than uh, all of us. Uh, we end up uh, people uh, boarding ships out in the Persian Gulf and uh, and uh, taking uh, taking uh, uh, semen for for hostage. You know, these things must stop somewhere. People, I mean, uh, we have to find ways. Uh, you know the people who are in charge to find the ways to to find a mean solution for all parties. You know. Yeah, and hopefully, uh, you know, expanded trade would be part of uh, you know whatever solution they, they they come up with. Yes, and that that would be good for good for the shipping markets uh, all around. Good for everyone, and it's good that we are hearing also reports that U.S. and China they are trying to find ways for more trade and less uh, tariffs and things like that. At least, you know, the two big powers in the world to show that they are, uh, that they are communicating and they have some uh, understanding with the needs of each other. So yeah. I'm not totally pessimistic, but there must, some logic must prevail. Now, regarding the dry bulk, as I told you, I'm optimistic and we see a lot of companies doing very well. So I, I think it's one sector that, uh, uh, we were waiting too long for this uh, moment to have uh, positive, uh, positive results and good profits. So it's the right time for investors to to invest in the sector and be a little bit more loyal than they used to be in the past. No, well, I think it's important what you what what you said about the uh, the the supply. I mean, it's a low low order book, the, lo the lowest in years, and. Uh, you know, I think if you look look across at some of your brethren in the the container business, I think they've they've tied up all the yard capacity for the next three four years. Yes, they did us big favor the the <laughs> container owners, but of course they had mega mega profits. We had good profits, but they had mega profits, so it's uh, you know they they had to renew their fleet and they had to reinvest the money. In the, in the industry and basically shipping companies are generally doing this over the years. You know, when you make some big profits, their investment in, the, in their industry and this is good for the world trade. Oh, sure, sure. Okay, well, I think we'll, uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up here. So, uh, Paulus, I wanna, wanna thank you for coming on. So I'm gonna, gonna sign out here. So it's Barry Parker for Capital Link's uh, Trending News Podcast Series. Thanks very much, Paulus, for coming on. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Barry. It was very nice to, to, to speak with you after a couple of years and look forward to see you soon. Well, I'll see you in person. It's another one of those, hey, how you been for two years? <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks. See you later.